You're listening to the Co-Creator Network. When you change the way you look at things, the things you look at change. Good afternoon. Welcome to Why Shamanism Now, a practical path to authenticity with your host, Christina Pratt. Director of the Last Mask Center for Shamanic Healing. She's talking about how shamanic skills can bring us to physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well-being, especially when nothing else can. Now, here's your host, Christina Pratt. Welcome, everyone, to Why Shamanism Now. This is your host, Christina Pratt, and I would like to begin our time here today calling in the spirits. I'd like to call in our ancestors, I'd like to call in all those who have gone before us, all the way back through all of the lines, back to the first people. I'd like to call out to these ancestors and ask them to be with us here today, that we might learn from those who have gone before us and that we might understand the ways of those who have gone before us and bring that which is true and meaningful into our lives here today. Let us be guided by the gifts and the wisdom and the legacy of our ancestors. And with that power, Let us heal those who are still caught and confused between the worlds. Let us live in a way that is good for all living things, be they in form or without form. So we call out to these ancestors to surround us here today, to hold this space that we might converse in a way that is good for all living things. And I call out to the earth below, the most ancient ancestor of life as we know it here on this planet. And I call out to the earth to be with us here today that we might all feel a sense of belonging and connection and oneness, interrelationship and interconnectedness with each other, that we might know this place as home and understand our responsibility with all things on this planet. It is becoming a very, very small home that we all share. May we live on it with that awareness and that connection and that consciousness, and do so in a good way. And may we plant our feet firmly here on the earth and reach up through our hearts and minds all the way up to the highest power of the universe, up into the sky, and by whatever name you call that power, the great above energy. Please call that energy down into our circle here today. Call it in to bring us protection, bring us blessing, bring us generosity to bring us the feeling of the benevolence of our universe and all the wisdom of the cosmos. May we call it in and have it be with us here today. And let each one of us remember that we are that place of this great love that births all life as we know it into existence, that great love of the earth and the sky. So may we know ourselves as beings born of this dream, the dream of this love. And open up our own hearts and let it it be that place of the alchemy of your life. So we call out to the spirit of the heart to be with us here today, that place that merges the great passions of the belly, of your purpose, of your desires in this life, with the wisdom and clarity of the mind. And the way the heart allows these things to come together in a good way, that they might be expressed as you living your life and bringing your unique gifts to the world. So we give thanks to these spirit energies for being with us here today, for gathering round. May what needs to be said be said and what needs to be heard be heard for the good of all living things. And I want to give thanks to those people who donate generously that this show is here for all of us to participate in, to listen, to speak, and to share the wisdom of many peoples in many ways and how we can bring that into life here in our contemporary lives. So I give thanks to Last Mass Community and their generous donations. And without further ado, I give thanks to our guest today, Stephen Baer, who is the author of a newly released book, Singing to the Plants. Stephen, welcome. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. And thank you for that beautiful invocation. That was a wonderful start. Well, thank you. I'm so excited because I have to admit, personally, after working on the encyclopedia, I haven't really had it found it very easy to read books about shamanism for a really long time, and I, I just got understand <laughs> that. <laughs> and I just got completely lost again and again reading not only your book but your things on your website. It's just delightful, and so thank you so much for this great gift that you've given us in your book, Singing to the Plants. That is so nice. Thank you so much for saying that. 
And truly, I just, I mean, my, my partner kept coming. I'm going, what are you doing? I said, oh, I got lost in that website again. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who want to go get lost in the website as I did, just so you know that, that um, it's a website for the book title. So just remember this beautiful title, Singing to the Plants. So it's singingtotheplants.com. And, um, and, and Stephen, can people buy the book through that site? You can, you can click on, on, you can click on the book there and there's a, a button there that will connect you to Amazon, or you can go directly to Amazon and buy it right there. Fabulous. So for those of you, um, who didn't read the intro for the show, this is a book, it's a guide about mestizo shamanism, which is shamanism in the upper Amazon and kind of around it's big um and and, and the spreading and, and spreading <laughs> no there uh, there's a great deal of interest in uh shamanism generally as you certainly know but there is also a great deal of interest in uh surprisingly the shamanism of the upper amazon and especially its its use of plant medicines and sacred plants so and there has been a great deal of interest uh, in this country, um, in throughout North America and Europe, in uh, what used to be sort of the terrain of anthropologists, the, uh, the shamanism of the Upper Amazon. Well, and this is largely our topic today is, I feel, after um, a while here um, offering up this radio show, we finally have someone to join us who can speak about, about the plant medicines from experience. And, and thoughtful experience, not just um, recreational experience, and can help us to truly understand what, what, what do the plant medicines bring to shamanism, how we can engage with them. It's, it's, it's such a huge and beautiful part of shamanism, not part of all shamanisms, mm-hmm. as you've said, um, but one that has um, – uh, rich avenues of exploration. But before we go any further, before I get completely distracted, um, Stephen, just tell us a little bit about, as you reflect back on your long and very colorful past, <laughs> in a good way, um, <laughs> what are the, the, the moments in your life that were truly pivotal that got you to be the person here that could write this book for us? Um. It's it's interesting. It, it it all began with machismo. Um, <laughs> I there was a time in my life uh, that I was very interested in wilderness survival, and I was trained in um, desert survival, mountain survival, and especially jungle survival. And I took a number of trips down to the Amazon um, to be trained in jungle survival and to go out into the uh, uh, the reserved areas between Peru and Ecuador and spend some time with the last of the headhunting Chopra and Kondoshi Indians studying their wilderness survival. Um, so now at this time, was this all just uh, bare-chested, eat the bugs and survive kind of thing? Or absolutely were you- right. Drop me naked in the desert with a knife and I will eat lizards and survive. Exactly mm-hmm. right. And it was part of the tradition is that you... Um, you sort of push your way through the wilderness. You conquer the wilderness. Uh, metaphors of conquest are are found throughout people who who do this kind of wilderness survival. But as I studied the wilderness survival uh, techniques of, of indigenous people in, in North and in South America, it became clearer and clearer to me that there was a significant spiritual component in surviving, even prospering in the wilderness. And so what, what, what first tipped you onto that? It was, it was um, observing the ways in which indigenous people interacted with their environment and the, the kind of respect that they gave to the environment and the way in which their method of interacting with the environment was one of trying to establish right relationship, not only um, in, uh, within the, the indigenous group, but with the, the spirits that surrounded the group in, in the cosmos. Because there's a whole lot of people that could do what you did, male and female, and never notice. I, uh, <laughs> I think that's true. Um, <laughs> 
uh, I don't want to claim any great credit for myself. I had come I, many, many, many years ago, when I was young, I had gotten a PhD in Buddhist studies. And I had been a professor of Buddhist studies for about 11, 12 years at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, um, at Berkeley, at Graduate Theological Union. And there came a time when, when I was sort of finished with that. Mm-hmm. And then for 25 years, I was a lawyer. I was a, a litigator at a, at a major international law firm. And, and as I was coming to the end of that path, and I became interested in, in, in the extended machismo of not only being a trial lawyer, but being a, a person trained in wilderness survival, um, I guess the circle started to close again. And as I became aware of the spiritual aspects of survival, much of what I was thinking about when I was studying Buddhism started to come back. So it was like a grand circle back back mm-hmm. to my roots. Yeah, it always reminds me of that dot of the yin and the yang and the dot of the yang and the yin. If you go far enough in, you flip over. I think, <laughs> so, I think no. that's exactly right. I think that's a great description. <laughs> okay, so you're telling us you're a you're, you're, you're survival guy, but you're noticing that the way these people, as you've said in your writing, not only survive, but they thrive. Mm-hmm. I, I had, I, I had currently people were wanting me to come talk on a show about how we need to learn that that we've been encoded by our ancestors only to survive, and we need to thrive, and it's our sort of our ancestors' fault. And I said, well, I can't come and do a radio show about that because our ancestors did thrive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, we I made think that's right. <laughs> Um, Okay, so you're noticing that they're thriving. So then what? So I start to try to figure this out. I have a curious mind, and and at that point, I start to, um, uh, I I start to participate in um, ayahuasca ceremonies in the Upper Amazon. I participate in um, meetings of the Native American Church, peyote rituals. I participate in mesa rituals with Wachuma in the Andes. Um, and I start, for example, going on vision fasts in the deserts of the Southwest. And I went on, I forget how many, six, seven vision fasts over the course of time in Death Valley, in the Gila Wilderness, in the Pecos Wilderness, all trying to, to understand how to, how to relate, how to have right relationship with the spirits of the wilderness. and especially with working with ayahuasca, and especially with two of my ayahuasca teachers, Doña Maria Tuesta Flores and Don uh, Roberto Acho Horama, um, getting more and more immersed in, in the remarkable healing tradition of the, of the Upper Amazon. And I was trying to, to understand. I was trying to reflect reflect on my experiences. I was trying to reflect on the plant medicine that Doña Maria was trying so hard to teach me, despite my blockheadedness. <laughs> and what Don Roberto was telling me about the nature of the ayahuasca ceremony and the nature of ayahuasca and the spirits. And as a result of that, I just had to write it down as a way of trying to make it clear to me and understand what had happened to me and what I had experienced. Because, well, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, for our listeners, if you have these same curiosities and you're only going to buy one book this year, this is the book to buy. And part of the reason is you do not have to wade through the psychological rationalization and scholarly blah, blah, blah that are found in most books. I mean, (laughs) pardon me if I'm annoying people, but, you know, clearly this is a book written by someone who has the brain of an academic, but the heart of a shaman. Well, that is so so nice. I I mean it. I mean, you, you, you did, frankly, what my publisher just kept saying to me, just Say what the shamans say. You don't have to 
argue for it. You mm-hmm. just and it just the beauty with it, you just lay it all out, you know, and without having to get into the whole. Well, this is what they say, but that can't possibly be real. <laughs> you know, well, like, well, <laughs> well, maybe it could. <laughs> I, I, I wound up doing a whole lot of reflection on what is real and what isn't, and uh, uh, it's uh, the tradition including the use of hallucinogens, but just generally the way shamanism is practiced in the upper Amazon, calls into question, subverts so many of our European assumptions about the nature of reality. And that was something, too, that I was trying to get across in the book, that um, if you take these kinds of experiences seriously, they have metaphysical, they have ontological implications that we still need to think through. Well, and given how well that whole European assumptions about the world is working out for us all these days, why not question them? <laughs> well, right. So, <laughs> so um, yes. Go ahead. Um, so I, um, uh, I wanted to get my thoughts in order, and I wanted to use all the tools that were available to me to try to figure out why I had gone through the changes I had. And there's no question that during this whole period, I, I, was, I was changing. And I don't know whether it was ayahuasca. I don't know whether it was the fact that my maestro ayahuasquero gave me his phlegm to keep in my chest. I don't know whether it was because I was getting older or my family was growing, but um, I have become very different. I have become centered. I have become less arrogant and full of rage. Uh, than I was when I first started trying to push my way through the jungle. Well, and how many years are we talking about here? Um, maybe 15. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody hear that? You know, this kind of transformation and awareness and transformation of self is not something you do in a weekend workshop. Even I, if ayahuasca I, is involved in the weekend workshop. You know, I, it's like, I have to agree with you. That is so important to be said, what you just said, um, and, and this is something that comes up a lot, I am sure, uh, for you as well as for me. Americans love epiphanies, transformative experiences. They, they love the, the quick change. And one of the things that I think people have to learn about ayahuasca, especially now that it's getting all of this publicity, about how you go down to the Amazon, you drink ayahuasca a couple of times, and you come back a transformed person. I think people do that. It doesn't happen, and they blame themselves. Mm -hmm. They think something is wrong with them because they don't see the pink neon buffalo coming over the horizon toward them. (laughs) Right, right. Um, can Can I tell a story? Yeah, absolutely. I love stories. I think human beings think in stories. Absolutely. Um... When I was doing uh, vision fast in the Southwest, I was also helping my vision fast teacher um, to put people up on the hill. And I was an apprentice, and I would help him out. And there was one occasion where um, this man in his mid-30s went out. We were in Death Valley, and the Eureka Mountains border Death Valley, and there are these washes. You can go up back into the Eureka Mountains. And he did that, and he found a cave. And he stayed in that cave for four days and four nights with no food and no tent and no fire. And at the end of four days, he came back down out of the hills, and he was distraught. He was crying because he had wanted a transformative experience. He had wanted an epiphany. He had wanted what I came to call the pink neon buffalo coming over the mountains toward him. And I I spoke with him, and, and I asked him what he had actually seen during those four days he was in the cave by Death Valley. And he had seen ravens circling in the sky. And he had seen... a a lizard under a creosote bush doing those kind of funny push-ups that lizards do. He had seen bat guano in the cave where bats used to be, but for some reason had left. 
And as we talk, it became clearer and clearer that the spirits had been talking to him all the time, but they had been speaking to him in whispers, mm-hmm. and he hadn't been listening. Yeah. yeah. And I think the same thing is true with many people who are called to the shamanic path. I think what happens is that they, they, they're looking for that sudden change, when in fact I think the spirits often just whisper quietly in our ears and wait for us to pay attention. Absolutely. In fact, there's a, at my third year of training, that's how I refer to it as learning to hear the whispers. Oh, because okay. Otherwise you get the two by fours and I don't know, I'm not 20 anymore. I can't <laughs> learn that way anymore. <laughs> it's just too dang hard. Yes. You know, the, the messages are always here and we can force the spirit world to scream at us, but that hurts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and the messages are always here. I once asked one of my teachers, Don Romulo Mahin, if he could see the spirits all the time. And he said, yes, he could. He said that drinking ayahuasca was actually like putting on glasses. Mm -hmm. The spirits that were vague before became clear when he drank ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. And the same thing is true for the spirits of the plants. The plants sing to us. And one of the things you do when you're being trained as a shaman in this tradition is you go out alone into the jungle, ingest one plant, remain in solitude, and, and listen for the song of that plant. And the plant will teach you its song. It will teach you how to use it. It will teach you what it's good for. But the plants, I was told, are singing all the time just like the spirits are present all the time. And they sing in what I was told was puro sonido, pure sound. And this is surrounding us all the time, and we just have to learn to listen for it. Yeah. I, the thing I often say to people when, when they're wanting to hear is like, well, you're probably expecting that tree to speak English to you, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> Guess yes. what? Not the universal spirit language. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and at the same, and this fits into what we were saying before, because they expect the spirits, they expect the plants to teach them in, you know, like American time. Mm-hmm. But the plants teach in plant time, yeah. just like they don't speak English. Right. And one of the things I don't think people are are necessarily all that aware of is the whole relationship with plants in these um, the people of this part of the world, even just the plants they're growing to eat, they're singing back to the plants, and you you sing at certain times of the day and certain songs, certain mm-hmm. aged people. I mean, the 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 for me, it's like lace or something of an intricate and beautiful geometry. This relationship between the humans and the plants, be they you know sacred plants or eating plants they're all sacred plants and that this song the whole song relationship with the plants is really um incredibly diverse and intricate and constant i th- i think that's i think that's beautiful thank you for for putting it that way that uh, i think i think that's right um, and i I have heard of people talking about, frankly, doing ayahuasca in Manhattan, where the person bringing the ayahuasca isn't even singing the songs. And I, I, I have a panic attack even hearing. I, I was, yeah, I was, I was told over and over again um, that the you you need the maestro unless you are a maestro yourself, and if you are, you know, God bless. But unless you are a maestro yourself, you need the maestro there for all kinds of reasons. Uh, the songs. Uh, protect you from uh, from sorcery, from intrusions into the sacred space. Don Roberto used to say, singing the arcanas, the protective songs, is like building a wall a thousand feet high and a thousand feet below the earth to protect the circle. And they say that um, the songs that the maestro sings guide the visions that you have when you're drinking ayahuasca. My plant teacher, Doña Maria, would get tired of my incessant questions, and she would say I was making her brain hurt, <laughs> and, and she would say, finally, I will show you. 
And that meant that the next time I drank ayahuasca, the questions I was asking her would be answered in my visions. Beautiful. She's a good teacher. She was wonderful. I loved that woman. She was difficult. <laughs> she, she was not a saint. Uh, she, uh, she would scold me. Uh, she would get angry. Uh, but she, was one, she loved children. She's the kind of woman who just by sitting still, and if a child came in the room, the child would automatically go stand by Doña Maria. Mm-hmm. She had that kind of aura around yeah. her. Um, and yes, it was, uh, her death was a, was a tremendous tragedy. So I wanted to shift gears here a little bit and indulge me if you will, and maybe you don't see it this way, but I see all these different plants, the, the plant hallucinogens or the, these sacred plant medicines, mm-hmm. each is kind of having their own personality. Yes. And I was wondering if you could share your sense of ayahuasca, in particular ayahuasca's personality. Um, I, I, I think I was just having a discussion with somebody the other day about exactly this. We, we have, I will digress and then circle around. Okay. Um, we, the, I just came from the, the MAPS conference in San Jose, mm-hmm. uh, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies. Thank you. Cause I couldn't quite remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Which was wonderful. I mean, this is the largest gathering of psychedelic researchers in 40 years. And everybody was there. There was tremendous excitement that finally uh, research was was going on again in this area. For example, uh, Charles Grob is mm. just about to publish the results of his use of psilocybin to treat anxiety in terminal cancer patients. Mm-hmm. And that is going to be published any day now, and it's going to be absolutely a blockbuster. Um, Very- But I noticed in listening to all of these papers, there was a very strong tendency to lump all of the sacred plants together. Um, uh, Peyote, ayahuasca, teonanakit, all of the sacred plants were somehow assumed to be psychedelic and therefore all the same. You know, that's like assuming every man is the same in bed. That's right. Well, I (laughs) I'm sorry. That's just no. crazy. <laughs> I, will, I will defer to your experience. <laughs> <laughs> or women. Whatever. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's like um, uh, it is disrespectful to the yes. sacred plants to assume yes, that they are all the same. Yes. Um, I am beginning to think, and, and I'm going to work this up and, and write this in some place, that there are really – three sort of major kinds of personality that plants have. And then there's a lot of individuality within that. I think plants, and this is going to just use terms that, that have been used generally. Um, I think there are hallucinogens. These are plants that create hallucinations, like, like ayahuasca, the mixture of plants called ayahuasca, or uh, toe. That's a number of different species in the genus Brookmansia uh, that contain a lot of scopolamine. Nicotine, found in tobacco, is a hallucinogen, if you take enough of it. Then there are empathogens. These are heart-opening sacred plants. And I think, for example, that the peyote cactus and the San Pedro cactus are heart-opening And finally, there are insight or depth-inducing sacred plants like the psilocybe mushrooms, teonanakit. Um, And then within each of these major groupings, there's a lot of personality difference. Um, And it gets complicated because all of these plants produce visual changes. Um, They overlap in some ways. Set and setting, of course, have a tremendous effect. But if you look at the hallucinogenic plants, for example, and compare ayahuasca to toe, uh, toe produces vivid hallucinations, and they're all frightening. Hmm. Whereas ayahuasca produces hallucinations that may be frightening, may be ambiguous, and may be warmly welcoming. Mm -hmm. So I think nobody should, I mean, 
even to lump hallucinogens together, I think, is disrespecting the personalities of plants. I think you put it exactly right. So let's continue from there and share for people who may be listening and fascinated but have never actually done a plant hallucinogen what um, the qualities, generally speaking, because it is different for everyone, but what, what, what a ayahuasca vision or experience um, is like assuming all the other pieces are where they belong in terms of the ceremony, the, the ritual of the experience. Um, I think... Um First of all, it takes a while for ayahuasca to uh, achieve its full effect. You have to drink it a bunch of times, I think. Some people are really lucky. They have wonderful visions the first time. It took me a while before anything happened. That may be just because I have a a head like a rock. (laughs) But ayahuasca, when it works, produces hallucinations. Um. In every modern sense of the term, it produces realistic, naturalistic, three-dimensional, interactive people and things that you see embedded in three-dimensional, explorable space. And it produces auditory hallucinations that are locatable in this three-dimensional space and often very neatly correlated with the visual hallucination. So the things you're seeing can talk to you? Yes. <laughs> For those who didn't quite follow that. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Less talk than sing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, in, a, in a famous uh, uh, article on the Shawar, Michael Harner used the expression, mm-hmm. uh, the sound of rushing water. Mm-hmm. And that's what the basic sound of the basic auditory hallucination of ayahuasca is. Um, it's, it's this rushing sound out of which you begin to discern music voices. Um, you begin to see a meaning within the, the jumble of sound that, that you are hearing. And so that, is, that becomes the singing of the plants. Yeah. That's the title of the book. (laughs) Once you have learned it and you've learned that song, then you use those songs to call the plant spirits in for healing or for protection or for attack. You learn to call in uh, uh, the spirits of the great shamans of the past. You use it to, to call thunderstorms or to avert thunderstorms. The song, the song can do anything, Mm -hmm. they say. Mm. Beautiful. So let's talk now a little bit about how then this particular plant medicine is used traditionally in the shamanic practices of the people. Ayahuasca. Um, if you, um, the three plants, uh, ayahuasca, doe, and mapacho, the tobacco, um, I call in the book the big three. These are the three major hallucinogens that are used in the upper Amazon among the mestizos. Um, I, um, mapacho is for protection. Nicotine gives you protection. Doe, scopolamine, gives you power. And ayahuasca, dimethyltryptamine, gives you information. Traditionally, Ayahuasca was not used as a healing medicine. It was used to give you information about lost objects, where game could be found, or most importantly, what breach of mutuality, generosity, and trust has caused the patient to become sick. So that then the shaman can suck out the darts, the pathogenic projectiles that have made the patient sick and call in the appropriate plant medicine to heal this, this wounded patient. So, so now that you said initially it wasn't used for healing. It's, it's really fascinating to watch the interaction between um, 
traditional mestizo shamanism. And I hesitate to use the word traditional in that context because it was never traditional. It was always eclectic. It was always syncretic. It was always voraciously absorptive of outside currents. Um, Mm -hmm. But if we can use the term to refer to what I now call pre-invasion mestizo shamanism, that is before large groups of North Americans and Europeans started going down into the jungle mm-hmm. to drink ayahuasca with indigenous and, and mestizo shamans. Um, this pre-invasion mestizo shamanism um, uh, did not generally use it for healing. They used it for information that would then lead to knowing how to heal and what was wrong with the patient that needed healing. When North Americans and Europeans started traveling down to the jungle, they brought with them, I think, a whole set of assumptions about the nature of healing, the nature of human suffering and how it is resolved, and the ways in which um, hallucinogens or other psychoactive substances are supposed to work. They brought with them their assumptions based on LSD, for example, or their experiments with mushrooms, or um, their experiments with, uh, with mescaline or what they had read about LSD and mescaline. And they brought these assumptions down to the Amazon with them and began to interpret their experience through this lens. And so what, what do you, what, if you can, can you like give us a quick list of what the, the heavy hitters of those assumptions that we bring? Sure. Um, we've already talked about one, that, um, that you, you are healed by a transformative experience, Mm -hmm. that there is an epiphany into the nature of reality that is somehow autonomously healing. Um, This healing is a psychological process and is based on a, um, a very discreet, individualistic set of psychological injuries that the patient is suffering from. Whereas in the upper Amazon, sickness is in a way physical. We can subvert that distinction later, but it is in a way physical because it is the result almost universally of a pathogenic projectile being inserted into the patient's body as a result of anger, envy, or resentment against the patient because the patient had broken social bonds of trust, mutuality, and generosity, and that this pathogenic projectile needs to be sucked out by the mouth of the healing shaman. So can you tell us a story, just for people that this is all new for, just the story (laughs) of what it would be like for someone, you know, just the the hypothetical person going to a shaman for healing? Um, So what, like, what would their symptoms be? um, The shaman, um, the mestizos in the upper Amazon Mm -hmm. make a distinction between um, natural diseases and and evil diseases, natural or God-given diseases. Um, of course, there's not a lot of agreement about what falls into <laughs> what category, but basically, um, ordinary God-given natural diseases are the kinds of diseases that can be treated by uh, gringo medicine. Mm-hmm. Like um, antibiotics or something. Yeah, like antibiotics or going to the hospital, whatever. But there is a large category of diseases that cannot be treated by gringo biomedicine. Um, these, uh, these range from uh, a kind of general malaise to um, uh, a um, run of bad luck, a cheating spouse, a failure in business, Aches and pains, sudden sharp pains that are accompanied by bad dreams and feelings of dread, 
In all of these cases, the person has been afflicted by the envy, malice, and resentment of another human being whom the patient has offended. All diseases thus are not just physical, but are social in nature. And what the shaman does by sucking the dart out of the physical body of the patient is in effect healing not just the physical body, but the body politic. Is healing the, the, the divisions between the person and the person who sent the dart. Because the, the again, because they've diagnosed what the transgressions are. Mm-hmm. So there, there's information delivered. It's not just, oh, here, let me suck out this dart and go home. But there's, there's, there's information given. And that information, because the patient drinks ayahuasca, then guided by the songs of the shaman, the patient in, in his or her vision will have an understanding of the breach of confianza um, that has caused this sickness to happen. The patient will see um, mm-hmm. who has conspired against him to destroy his business and why. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they can also then potentially go and make amends. They can do that. Or, of course, they can counterattack. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which that, will that lead to counterattack and counterattack. Yeah. Um, so I'm a shaman, say. Mm-hmm. And I have just sucked a dart out of your body. Mm-hmm. And now I have this dart, or many darts. There are many things I can do with them. Remember that these darts are dangerous. They're pathogenic. I can absorb them into my own phlegm and make them part of my own armamentarium to increase my power, uh, to give me a store of different kinds of darts that I can then use for defense or offense. Frequently, what I would do, if I were that kind of a shaman, is send them back to the person who sent them. So there is um, attack, there is counterattack, there is offense, and there is defense. Um, And I think, let me try to explain this, because There is in the upper Amazon, I think, a very profound way of looking at life and death, which is very, very different from from what we have as North Americans or what um, many people who are interested in shamanism read about in, you know, beginning texts of shamanism. Um, In the upper Amazon, there is no clear line between a shaman and a sorcerer. They both use the same instruments. They both use the same powers. They both use the same plants. They both use the same kinds of songs. There is no clear line between healing and harming. Life is seen, as some anthropologists have put it, as in the model of predator and prey, in great cycles of life and death. For example, among many indigenous people in the upper Amazon, you cannot heal one person without harming another. Because you've got to take this dart and put it someplace. And if you just put it on the ground, somebody's going to step on it, it's going to hurt them. Among the Yaga, a shaman will suck out a dart and throw it toward the sun where it goes underground into the land of people who live underground called the people without an anus. And the people without an anus are hit by these darts and made sick. And so in retaliation, they throw clods of earth up onto the ground where the children of the Yaga eat them and become sick in turn. That's a problem. That is... that. It is... (laughs) It is a problem because that is the way life is in the upper Amazon. Now, with that said, I think it's important to bear in mind that there is a distinction between the healer and the harmer, the shaman and the sorcerer, and that is self-control. Mm-hmm. And it often is, in these cultures, the, 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 
there's just a different word. Say, like, like you were saying, same action, same whatever, mm-hmm. but people do know the difference. Oh, they do know the difference. Yeah. And, and in some ways, um, we think of sorcery as, as being negative because, again, we, we draw clear lines between the, the healer and the sorcerer. And um, in some ways, sorcery is an enforcer of social norms. Uh, people uh, who are not otherwise inclined to be generous may be generous because if they are not generous, they may be subject to, to envy, resentment, and sorcery. At the same time, the figure of the sorcerer represents all that is considered to be morally bad. The sorcerer is, is a kind of negative example. It's... Um, to people who, who are used to a, um, a view of shamanism as being solely nurturant, solely beneficial, uh, practiced by selfless practitioners who, who, who practice in humility. Oh, people, and even worse, if you were to not follow those rules, your helping spirits would immediately abandon you, and you would, it would be obvious to everyone that yes. you... Yeah, right. So the, the culture, of the, the shamanic culture of the upper Amazon may look cruel, may look unkind, may not fit into the pattern of shamanism as, as people often think about it. But I think it is a very rich deep and profound view of human life and, and the role of the shaman in human life. I think it's a tragic view um, because it encompasses both life and death, healing and harming. It sees both the similarities and the differences between shamans, between healers and sorcerers. Um, well, and I, I think that we... We... Well... We need three hours for me to make this point, but the simple version would be <laughs> I, that... I, I, what, see, you got me going. I spent all my time yeah. talking. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just that we live in a way, in this culture, where we are utterly unaware of the constant dynamic of unconscious sorcery in our everyday life. And, and so it's partly why I'm kind of letting you go on with this, because... I want you to be able to lay out that platform because um, this is a piece that we don't get. We we look at them, we think, oh, how could they possibly live that way? And we don't realize how brutal we are energetically all the time and perhaps more so because we do it so unconsciously. Mm-hmm. I think that's right. Can I tell you a story? Sure. All right. As I said, in the upper Amazon, they believe that, that shamanic power – is, is manifest physically as a kind of phlegm in the chest in which these darts are kept. And the darts of sorcerers can appear as toads and scorpions and snakes and the beaks of, of birds or monkey teeth or razor blades. And these pathogenic projectiles are projected into the body of the suffering patient to be sucked out by the mouth of the healing shaman. Here's my story. I was attending a a workshop with a man for whom I have nothing but the most profound admiration and respect. And I was sitting there in this workshop feeling angry at him for the most childish of all possible reasons. I felt he wasn't paying enough attention to me. And one day during this workshop, as he was speaking... Out of my mouth, there came a spider. It shot out of my mouth, a big, hairy spider, black, about the size and shape of an egg. And it landed on his cheek and dissolved into his face. And I said to myself, whoa, I didn't know I was that angry. And I I didn't think about it anymore. Until the next day, he came back into the workshop distraught because they had discovered the previous day that his wife's breast cancer 
that they thought was in remission had returned. Now, I know rationally that I had nothing to do with that. I know rationally that the spider hit him, not his wife. Even if the spider could somehow affect it, it certainly couldn't go back in time and cause this remission the day before. But I still feel guilty. And I feel guilty because I think that the people in the upper Amazon are right when they say that human beings have an innate tendency to harm each other that needs to be controlled by self-control. And that you, you constantly have to keep the darts that are in your body that take the shape of spiders and scorpions and, and, and monkey teeth and razor blades under control because they want to get out and hurt somebody. And it seems to me that we have all done this. Everybody has had words come out of their mouths that hurt the people they most admire and most respect, but they don't see them as spiders and scorpions and razor blades. Mm -hmm. They don't see what ayahuasca reveals, which is the nature of the harm that they inflict upon those they most love. Well, as you said about the teacher who said, yes, I see the spirits all the time, but with the ayahuasca, I see them more clearly. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, we, we don't, we don't see what's happening all the time, Mm -hmm. but you know, with the ayahuasca, we could see it more clearly. And the question would be then, you know, do we have the spiritual maturity to find the control to be people that are capable of harming all, harming or healing all the time? Mm-hmm. Yes, I think that, 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 that's exactly right. I think that's very well put. And I, I know from my own experience, and I, I <laughs> Timothy White, you know, criticized this in in the encyclopedia about me taking a moralistic stance and I really just didn't do a very good job writing it because I was trying to take a functional stance because I really do feel a feeling. It's sort of like, I guess I would say it now in the context of what we're talking about when I am practicing and I am, um, I can feel the feeling of being in harmony with the songs. Mm -hmm. And in that, I am very aware that I am practicing healing <laughs> mm-hmm. because I'm in harmony with songs and these are not human songs. In other words, I'm doing my best through the work with the help of spirit to move these two human beings, myself and the person mm-hmm. into some kind of harmony and alignment with the songs that already exist. Whereas often people have asked me to do things and, and as I come up to that in the journey Mm-hmm. It feels dissonant with the songs, and I might spend some time to figure out if there's any way to accomplish the person's desires in a way that's in harmony with the songs. Right. And if there isn't, I just tell the person I can't do this. Mm-hmm. And, and my point was not that, I'm, that this is even moral or immoral. My point is that there are songs there. There is a pattern. There is a harmony, and that we can, if we're tuned in, we can feel ourselves harmonizing with it, um, enhancing it, um, or being dissonant to it. Mm-hmm. And that it's and and that for me, that's a sense of how, and we can feel that. So that's how we get a sense of whether our actions are moral or immoral. Is that we can feel that dissonance, and so I don't think that it's so much about um, good or bad or judgment but a sense of asking ourselves, are these actions in this moment in, in harmony with this, with the bigger song? Or mm-hmm. is it just me singing my own song? <laughs> Absolutely out of tune with everything else, um, which we are also capable of doing. You know, we can mm-hmm. completely make up our own thing that doesn't have any harmony with anything if we choose to as humans. I, I think we choose a path. And, and then we have a responsibility to stay on that path. Um, mm-hmm. my, my two main teachers, my plant teacher, Doña Maria, and my maestro, Ayahuascaro, Dona Roberto, both referred to this path as pura blancora, pure white. 
And this is the path that they were following where they had themselves under control. It was the path of pure healing. And, and I think you, you, you pick that path. You choose it. And, and the lesson that I learned from that spider, you know, I've been tempted to do it again. You know, somebody cuts in front of you in traffic and gives you the finger and you say, oh, Mm -hmm. and I've been tempted to do that again, or at least try it, see if it works again. And, and I know I can't, I can't, I'm not allowed. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's, um, and I think that has made a big difference to me in, in the way I behave in the world and, and how I see myself in the world. And I think, um, you, you, you choose a path because you know what the alternative paths are. If you just think there's only one path, then it isn't a choice. And I well, think and it's the, the choice that gives us strength. Yes. And one of the things, if you think about it, especially as we were talking about it before, the way I see the other path is it just ends up being too costly. Mm-hmm. To, ever, to life. I mean, not just to me personally, to life, because then there's the retaliation and there's the, you know, it, it goes back and forth and back and forth and there's no reconciliation. It just keeps costing. Mm-hmm. And this is the thing that I say to my students all the time is, you know, look at the cost. What is the true cost of these actions energetically and for life, all life? Mm-hmm. And is there another way to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish in a way that is not so costly? Mm-hmm. That benefits life. And and just for those of you that don't know, this whole dialogue is shows up in shamanisms all over the world. And we're, we're stuck with English, which puts it into white and black and red and you're, you know, which is a little problematic because of racism and things like that. But the point that is often found in it is the distinction is the distinction between supporting things in their na- nature or manipulating things to go against their nature. Mm-hmm. And that, to me, that was the thing that I could find that was consistent cross-culturally is, is, you know, are we supporting life, all life, in moving in its nature, or are we imposing our will? As you said, you know, are we out of control, essentially, and mm-hmm. wanting to manipulate things into a direction? A very short story is this woman was talking about how she went down to South America and she was working with ayahuasca with shamans in uh, the Shuar, I believe. Mm-hmm. And, you know, blah, blah, blah with her husband. And the the shaman just said, well, do you want him back or not? And she said, yes, I do. And, <laughs> and got him back, did, did a little love medicine, mm-hmm. got him back. It was a disaster. <laughs> as As this relationship unfolded, that actually the parting, when it had happened, was really the best thing for the two of them. She just mm-hmm. couldn't see it at that time. And so they were following their natural path. It was just painful at that time of grieving and loss. But if she'd hung in there, it would have been fine. Instead, she had this powerful manipulative medicine, and then she and her husband both ended up paying. It was terrible mm-hmm. for both of them. So uh, I, There's another – Marie Perruchon is a French anthropologist who lived with Chouard and, in fact, married a, a Chouard man. And in a story like you would get from O. Henry – they they later found out after they were married that they had used love magic on each other. <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like that O. Henry story about the Christmas yeah. presents. Yeah, yeah. So I, I an hour is up, if you can believe it. Um, so I want to thank you, but I also want to take a minute and let people know again how to get a hold of you and your book. So... Um, all right, can I, can I plug the book? Absolutely. All right. The book is um, Stephen Beyer, B-E-Y-E-R. It's called Singing to the Plants, A Guide to Mestizo Shamanism in the Upper Amazon. It's published by the University of New Mexico Press. You can get it on the website, www.singingtotheplants.com, which also has an extensive blog of things that I have written about every once in a while. Um, there is a Facebook page for Singing to the Plants, and I have a Facebook page. So if you want to get in touch with me, the, the easiest and best way is, is through Facebook. Just look for Steve Beyer on Facebook and, and send me a message. I would, be, I would be happy to hear from anybody. Excellent. And Steve, thank you so much for today. Well, thank you so much. For, I had a wonderful time, and I really appreciate uh, your, your very nice words about the book. 
Thank you. So I want to give thanks to the ancestors for holding us so beautifully here in this this time here today for the earth below and the sky above and the big love from which we are all born. And I want to thank the energy of the heart that unites us all. I want to thank my community for supporting the show and helping it to happen. And um, for those of you that want more information about Last Mass Center, it's just lastmasscenter.org. Um, we have a brand spank a new website and you can get information about um, classes, me, um, sessions, the encyclopedia and uh, on that website and all of the shows that have been archived for Why Shamanism Now are available to you free of uh, charge on iTunes. Just um, Google Why Shamanism Now on iTunes. So Steve, thank you. Everyone, thank you. Have a great week. <laughs>